Hello, good evening. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live on my news up here at Desawe Kanda. We're also live on TVT Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. I am Alfred Okanse. Tonight, the Auditor General's report on the COVID-19 expenditure has stoked a huge public reaction and outcry regarding the number of irregularities that have been exposed and the amounts involved tonight. We hear from some of the institutions cited. The Director General of the Ghana Health Service will be joining us tonight. Also, we'll hear from both sides of Parliament on this latest development. Stay with me. We're getting to all of that. Also tonight, the Bank of Ghana has broken a silence on the cocoa bonds default, clarifying the seeming confusion on the market and allaying fears. We speak to the experts on what exactly the status of these bonds are and if there's any cause for alarm. Stay with us. We're getting to all of that on Ghana tonight. Meanwhile, the government has reached an agreement with the Ghana Association of Banks to review the terms of the domestic debt exchange program will tell you the details and what this means for government's quest for the three billion dollars from the imf and the imf program entirely and also the domestic debt exchange program stay with me all of these and more tonight and we we're focusing quite strongly on uh, this auditor general's report on the covid 19 expenditure the monies that we received as a country and how they were used. In fact, we'll start getting responses from the various agencies that have been cited in this report and the details that we're going to be giving to you tonight. Join us. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana tonight on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get talking. Well, let's settle for Ghana Briefs. The government of Ghana and the Ghana Association of Banks have agreed to modify the terms of the domestic debt exchange program. The modification, an agreement to pay 5% coupon for 2023 and a single coupon rate for each of the 12 new bonds, resulting in an effective coupon rate of 9%. There will also be clarity on the operational framework in terms of access to the Ghana Financial Stability Fund and the removal or amendment of all clauses in the exchange memorandum that empowers the Republic to, at its sole discretion, vary the terms of the exchange. The Vice Chairman of the Finance Committee of Parliament, Patrick Boma, says the NPP administration should forget the 2024 general elections. If the Finance Minister, Ken Foyata, goes ahead and use individual bonds and pension funds as debt exchange in seeking an IMF bailout. Banking sector cleanup or financial sector cleanup affected us in, 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 a, in, a, in a bad way in the 2020 election, I must say. Because there were MPP prides itself of having a strong base within the middle class. And that was the class that the cleanup affected. If you are saying you are going to affect individual bondholders, that means you are putting the party at a higher risk of losing the 2024 general election. Ranking member on the Health Committee of Parliament, Kwabnami Kando says the Auditor General's COVID-19 audit is just a tip of the iceberg on the misuse of public funds in the name of COVID-19. I hear an amount of um, an amount of about 120 million Ghana cities yeah. has been paid paid to UNICEF to UNICEF for uh, vaccine procurement, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. As of 2021. You see, this document was given to us when we discussed the 2022 budget. As at that time, per their own records, okay, we had an excess of 5 million doses of vaccines, of which some of them were ex expired, okay? And a chunk of these vaccines were donated to the country free of charge. <laughs> The Private Education Coalition has justified the increase in fees charged by some private schools. 
president of the coalition, Samuel Yaboa, tells TV3 the increase is due to the current economic challenges and urge parents to bear with school owners. Parents that really, really understand the value of private education and really want to invest in their children's future will have to weigh the two. Of course, the government offers free education, but when you know what you get when you go there, you weigh the two. So I will appeal to parents that are tempted to withdraw from the private sector to rather negotiate with the school proprietors, sit down with them, maybe come out with a payment plan. Let's not um, be quick to take decisions that will affect our children's education. A five-member committee has been set up to investigate the riot by students of the Krobia Asante Technical Vocational School at Asokore in the Ashanti region. The school has since been closed down. The damage is very enormous, so there will be costs. So there should be some people who should suffer much. There might be people who even were not around, but if we just uh, don't do a very good uh, investigation, there will also be casualties. And when the, the cost is allotted to the whole population, they are also going to benefit. So we have to do a very good work. Uh, the documents available to the house for example, the amount that has been reported as an amount that has come from the World Bank, for example, I'm only using one example because we are yet to begin our investigation from Parliament. So, for example, if you look at the media review budget 2021 on page 99, you realize that an amount of about 2.48 billion has been quoted as an amount received from the World Bank. Okay, that is the records available to us. Now, when you read the Auditor General's report, you are reading an amount of about 1.97 billion. So there's a discrepancy of about 500 million here. Where has it gone to? We need more explanations to this issue. So it is not just the issue of the Auditor General alone. It is going beyond that. Hasn't been documentation for it and all that. Should somebody be held responsible for this? Why not? In any serious jurisdiction, we are in 2023 for Christ's sake. We are discussing issues that happened in 2021 and nobody has suffered or has paid anything or has refunded any money. Well, that's the MP for Jaboso Constituency. He is a ranking on the Health Committee of Parliament. This interview that my colleague Komla Klucha, our Chief Parliamentary Correspondent, had with him, stay with me on Ghana tonight. We're going to play the extensive version of this interview tonight. But he raises fundamental questions about accountability and who should be standing trial or people should be answering questions for this. It's becoming increasingly clear that COVID-19 and Russia-Ukraine war are the least of our problems as to why we are in this economic mess. In fact, if the records and how things are playing out is anything to go by. COVID-19 actually was a blessing to some people in government or public officers who have continuously blamed COVID-19 for our economic mess that we find ourselves in. Look at the amount of money government of Ghana received from the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the Africa Development Bank, AFDB, the European Union, all of these institutions or agencies give us money to fight COVID. Not to talk about their free vaccines and the number of interventions that, that we sign on to. But take a look at this. This is a document that is in the Auditor General's report detailing how much we received, that is, Gamma Ghana received in terms of money, grants, assistance to fight COVID. Look. Government of Ghana Contingency Fund, the COVID alleviation program, some a little over 1.2 billion. It's in there. And then the World Bank Group Funds, health interventions. You have in there the fast track COVID-19 facility of $35 million. 
you see it there, that's in the column B. And then the first one has some $65 million under the Garrett intervention from the World Bank Group. C, fast track COVID-19 additional facility, we receive additional facility from, from the World Bank, $130 million. And then another fast track COVID-19 additional facility too, $200 million. And this, they classified, according to the auditor general report, the program supported at the COVID-19 emergency preparedness and response plan. That's EPRP1 and 2. This is what the World Bank money was used for. That's what you see there. It's clear. Then we had some $1 billion from the IMF. That's column 3. Please take a look at that. Column 3 has the IMF support of an equivalent of almost 5.6 billion CDs. Take a look at that. That we received in 2020. Then the Africa Development Bank, also all of this went into the 2020 budget support because you remember COVID-19 threw that 2020 budget out of course. So we needed money, we needed support to execute government interventions and then all the COVID support programs that we put in there. So the AFDB, Africa Development Bank, gave us some 398,745,781 CDs. The EU also 569,617,581 CDs. Then guess what? Column six. The Bank of Ghana COVID-19 bonds. There was a COVID-19 bonds that the Bank of Ghana had to raise and, and actually give to government the money of $10 billion. That's 10 billion CDs, I beg your pardon, 10 billion CDs. That was the COVID-19 bonds from the Bank of Ghana. Then other government of Ghana funding that came in. That is you and I, our money, it's essentially. That we, the government used in fighting. Well, we were told that we used to fight COVID-19. 827,794,389 CDs. I'm detailing all of this so you know where the money came from. The funding sources for COVID-19, how much in there, and the grand total. And what we found out in the coming days I'll show you how much we spent on the free water and electricity which we are now paying for but the auditor general's report which has got all of us angry and asking questions details all of this how much money came in now question was how much and how did we spend this money cost per the reports and the details about 25 percent of this was expended so Where's the rest of the money? And all of the discrepancies that Kobna Mita Kando and many other people have raised about what the finance minister said and what the Auditor General is saying and the differences in the amounts. Take a look at this. This is one of them. Let's raise questions. It says, we noted that the Ministry of Health on behalf of the government of Ghana paid an amount of a little over $120 million dollars to UNICEF, and I'm going to put that on the screen right now, and AVAT for the supply of vaccines. However, a little over 5.1 million, that's doses of vaccines valued of a little over $38 million were supplied to the National COVID code room, leaving a difference of over 81 million CDs. The Auditor General is recommending that the Chief Director of the Ministry of Health should renegotiate with UNICEF and other to recover the outstanding amount. This one, this particular one, the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Patekuma Boaji, has been responding to it. He's going to be speaking tonight, stay with me on Ghana Tonight, and about this one and, and how they're going to renegotiate this $81 million to get our money back or whether we're expecting any more vaccines to be this is delivered under this said arrangement or this contract. Now, this will not surprise many of you 
Because when this country, when it emerged that Ghana paid more than, what, $2.8 million to Sheikh Al Maktoum, remember that, for the procurement of Sputnik V vaccines, which were not delivered. The health minister said he was not in his right self when, when all of this arrangement took place. So does it surprise you that we're, we're reading all of this and how these things are coming? I remember the, the minority also pushing for a probe of government COVID-19 expenditure. We were told that the Auditor General will do that job. So no need for a probe. Now the report on the COVID-19 expenditure is here. Instead of just asking people to refund money in some instances, which is no deterrence to corruption. What else will be done? Take a look at another one. If you think this was enough, this is it. The ambulances we paid for have not been delivered. Hmm? 121. We noted, and this is the Ministry of Health has to respond to this. We noted that the ministry entered a contract signed 15 December 2021 for the supply of 26 Toyota Hairs Deluxe ambulances valued at over $4 million, out of which just about 607,000 US dollars was paid. And it goes on, it gives details. The Auditor General is recommending. In fact, the explanation that the, sub, the chief director gave that the supplier applied for extension to meet some technical specifications. You know, this issue of the procurement of ambulances in this country, for some very strange reason, it always comes with all of these arrangements that are opaque in some instances and raises questions about transparency. The health ministry we're waiting for answers to this. And please, those of you who are saying that this is evidence of corruption, uh, that it's not limited to the politician, well, fair point. But the solution to this, this, all these captured in the Auditor General's report, among civil servants and, and other public sector workers, lies with the political appointee. Look at this other one. During the review, they noted that senior management staff and other supporting staff of the Ministry of Information paid themselves a total of 151,500 cities as COVID risk allowance for coming to work during the lockdown. Wow. Contrary to the presidential directives and without approval from the office of the chief of staff, this people were going to work during COVID. In fact, we were at work at least. Some, in fact, frontline health workers who were going to work during COVID. All of these people, in some instances, were not even giving any form of incentives or insurance. We don't even know the details of the insurance was said to have been procured on their behalf. Some 10 insurance companies were engaged. And look, stay with me. In the coming days, we would give you the details of these insurance companies, 10 of them that were engaged under this program to ensure frontline workers. Something you want to stay with us in the coming days for. But this is it. They paid themselves over 151,000 for coming to work, risk allowance during lockdown without approval. How many frontline workers got this? And then this one. So there are many, many details in there that we're going to take time to unpack. But the major concern that's on the minds of lots of you, which we do share, is that, look, when these details are captured in the Auditor General's report, we lament about it for days. Public Accounts Committee will sit. MPs will get angry. We'll see them on national television. After their recommendations, what happens? Why do we every year capture people for diverting public funds for other uses, and they go scot-free. Stay with me. Dr. Patakuma Bwajil will be joining us after this. Dr. John Osai Kwapong is also joining us. My colleague Kumar Kluche has already sat with Governor Minta Kando and also Patrick Buama on these issues. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Ghana Tonight. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. And let's hear from you. We'll be taking a number of your comments that have come through already. The hashtag is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and Twitter. Ranking member on the Health Committee of Parliament, Kwabana Mita Kando, and is a member of Parliament for the Job also Constituency. He has been talking to my colleague, Kamla Kluche, about the details of this Auditor General's report on the COVID-19 expenditure raises questions about the differences in figures reported by the finance minister and now the auditor general's report take a look uh, the documents available to the house for example the amount that has been reported as an amount that has come from the world bank for example i'm only using one example because we are yet to begin our investigation from parliament so for example if you look at the mid-year review budget 2021 on page 99 you realize that an amount of about 2.48 billion has been quoted as an amount received from the world bank okay that is a record available to us now when you read the auditor general's report you are reading an amount of about 1.97 billion so there's a discrepancy of about 500 million here where has it gone to we need more explanations to this issue so it is not just the issue of the auditor general alone it is going beyond that hasn't been documentation for it and all that should somebody be held responsible for this why not in any serious jurisdiction, we are in 2023 for Christ's sake. We are discussing issues that happened in 2021 and nobody has suffered or has paid anything or has refunded any money. In any serious jurisdiction, somebody would have suffered for this. I hear an amount of, um, an amount of about 120 million Ghana cities yeah. has been paid. Paid to UNICEF. To UNICEF for uh, vaccine procurement, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. At 2021, you see, this document was given to us when we we're discussing the 2022 budget. As at that time, per their own records, okay, we had an excess of five million doses of vaccines, of which some of them were ex expired, okay, and a chunk of these vaccines were donated to the country free of charge. And I can quote, if you go to the, in their, in their report, mm -hmm. they have um, AVATT stroke, AU stroke, WB. Uh, and then we have what bilateral, bilateral gave us, and we have COVAX. Yeah. So the COVAX one is free. free. What bilateral gave us is free. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that constituted about more than 90% of what we needed at the time. Kwekwaji Mameno is still at post. You think that this is enough evidence to nail him for him to be we, 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 we have more than enough evidence. And you see, let me also make this point. When it comes to COVID expenditure, it goes beyond the Ministry of Health. Mm. Other ministries come to play, mm. especially the minister responsible for finance. Okay? As for Kwekwaji Mameno, mm. I mean, it is only President Akufuado who entertains such a minister in this government, in the whole world. Absolutely nothing is convincing me that that man should stay in that office for even more than a minute. Well, so that's Kwabnami Takando. He is the ranking member on the Health Committee of Parliament in that exclusive interview with my colleague Kumla Kluche earlier today. Now, questions about the monies that we paid for vaccines that have yet to be delivered also is one issue that's got lots of you indeed uh, talking. I'm going to put that aspect of the Auditor General's report on the screen while we welcome Dr. Patrick Kumabwaji, Director General of the Ghana Health Service shortly. But this, this is the detail um, of the report of the Auditor General on the COVID-19 expenditure that we do have now and that was what i indicated earlier about some a little over 100 and this is it they noted that the ministry of health on behalf of the government of ghana paid an amount of 120 a little over 120 million dollars to unicef avat for the supply of vaccines however just about 5.1 million doses of vaccines valued at 
$38.322 million was supplied to the National Code Room, leaving a difference of $81,870,379 with UNICEF, meaning that we've already paid for this. Okay, so let's go on the telephone now. Dr. Patrick Kumar Baji is Director General of the Ghana Health Service. Dr. Patrick Kumar Baji, this is the aspect of the report I made reference to. So exactly why has this money been paid but we're yet to receive over $81 million worth of vaccines. Dr. Baji. Remember in the middle of 2021, when vaccine application was a problem for, I mean, lower middle income countries, most of the vaccines were left for the rich, and we also had the Indian crisis, and so there was virtually no vaccine. It's true that the AU, through the AVAX mechanism, came out with a package of protecting uh, vaccines for African countries. And so then, uh, based on our gaps, we asked for 16.9 million doses to be delivered to us. But in managing vaccine and other logistics, expiry date and storage is extremely important. For the vaccine, it is the cold chain facility. Do you have enough capacity to store all those vaccines in your country? That's one. And if you have them, are you able to deliver them within the period of the expiry of the particular batch that we are getting? So the obvious thing is to secure the quantity you need, stagger the delivery based on space in your your um, coaching capacity, and that is why it's been staggered. Mind you, at that time, too, we had about 20% of our Indian supply by the COVAX facility. And then soon after that, we also have started having some donate, bilateral donations to Ghana. And uh, I think that came to almost about 15 million doses were given to us to donations. So what you do is that you stagger them. We have so far received six million plus. The last one million was delivered last week in a situation of the current campaign. And so that's how we've been starting to be delivered over the period that we needed. Otherwise, if we took all the 16, you will not be able to deliver them and they will expire. And most importantly, we will not have the cool room space to stock all those vaccines in addition to what we already had. So we've not lost any money. What it means is that they will have to now uh, supply us and when we need it. But of course, um, if you come to a state that I believe the state thing that we may not need all that, okay. it can be renegotiated. But that's not uh, for me to decide. Well, it is the renegotiation bit that the Auditor General is also making the recommendation for, that you should go and renegotiate with UNICEF for the remaining amount of money. That is in the recommendation in the, the Auditor General's report. And I believe that this is a report you have seen, Dr. Patrick Kumar Baji. Um, I don't know what was the premise for that. Recover vaccines or recover the money. And they continue to deliver. And so I believe that uh, maybe the matter doing some misunderstanding, but whatever it is, this is something that can be uh, revisited. That's why there are other opportunities to give further explanation as to why this uh, happened. But the issue that we not just any money, those vaccines are going to be available when we need them. But of course, if the state or the ministry decide that maybe we don't need all that anymore, we have other sources, they can probably negotiate to see, based on the recommendations, to see how uh, we can reduce the number and then we are fine those funds to something else. Well, well, but they were very clear. They are talking about recovering or renegotiating the outstanding amount. And I'm reading this from the report. So whatever renegotiation that they are recommending, the Auditor General is recommending that you should go back to UNICEF or that's AVAT with, per the details of this said report, will be on the amount paid, that's the over 81 million 
dollars that we paid for vaccines that are yet to be delivered, that is going to be the subject for the renegotiation. What about you? Well, what I'm saying is basic that it is for staggering and those vaccines will be used when as and when it's stationed we, we need them we have the cold chain and then they are also suppliers and that's what they even last week we received one more million dollars there was a time we wanted to bring more but we also didn't have we had enough vaccines and we didn't want to cause and um, expire of other vaccines so that's how it is managed so i'm sure this is something that the ministry could further sit down and take a decision on what to do, whether we will, based on the contract, whether it is you will negotiate or you continue needing the vaccine. But of course, we still need more vaccines for our booster and those people who are yet to be vaccinated. Is there a clause in there, um, in this contract with UNICEF, for the renegotiation to be done? That is this recommendation by the Auditor General for you to go and renegotiate. Per the contract we signed with UNICEF, is there any clause that gives us that opportunity to do so? We, we, we don't have an agreement to UNICEF. UNICEF is just a facilitator of delivering vaccines safely to countries because of the infrastructure they have in managing vaccines over the years. The contract is between and Ebert, and I believe that uh, I have not fully privy to the full contract that will be the foreign ministry, but I'm sure if there are clauses that they can be used, they will, they will review that and get back to you. Meanwhile, the ministry is going to also give you uh, a, a, a statement on that. Okay, so uh, Dr. Patrick Gutman, but just stay with me a bit. Let me now also welcome uh, Dr. John Osai Kwapong. Uh, he is a senior fellow, Development and Democracy at the Center for Democratic Development, CDD. Uh, Dr. John Osai Kwapong, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us in Ghana tonight. Good evening, Alfred. Great, it's good to have you. Now, for you've seen the details of uh, at least um, aspects of this Auditor General's report on the COVID-19 expenditure. Now, do you share in the concern of many that this only points to a lot more questions about how these monies we received and we actually took from the government's coffers or the people's coffers was expended during this period leaves more questions than answers? Yeah, to, you know, to a large extent, yes, it, it, it does. Um, but I think the, the Auditor General um, was thorough enough to raise all the kinds of the red flags and pointed to some of the infractions that we, you know, we see in the report in terms of the, uh, the expenditures and how the monies that came in to help us, you know, fight COVID-19 uh, were, were spent. Um, in terms of additional questions, well, then now one has to wonder, for example, if you look at uh, some of the bypassing of approval processes and the auditor's recommendation that, you know, you can go back and get uh, retroactive approval, things like that. Yes, it does raise questions as to is that the normal practice whenever the auditor finds infractions? And if not, why that option being provided, you know, to a given chief director before, let's say, the auditor would exercise his powers of, of, of disallowance? Mm -hmm. So I think we have, we have quote unquote, a lot of answers in terms of how the monies were spent. Um, perhaps we can do some more probing as to the consequences of all of this, right? So given what we are seeing contained in the auditor's report, you know, why did some things okay? Why did some things not okay? Um, and how do you rectify some of these things? Because far too often, we keep seeing the same infractions coming up over and over again in various auditor general's report. And so it becomes this repeated pattern of behavior that you say to yourself, why can't the police patrols that we put in place to ensure that 
for every one city that we are spending um, of, of, of public revenue uh, that, that is being spent by following all, all the rules that we, we, we have in place. And I'm sure that's the concern of many because look, we see this, these infractions and irregularities captured in the Auditor General's report every year for as long as I can remember. But, and it keeps recurring. And so what has to be done differently this time around? We're talking about COVID. I mean, this, this, is, this is something that government has blamed for, together with the Russian Ukraine war, for the economic crisis we're in right now, only to find out that we actually we benefited from COVID because of the monies we received. What has to be done? I am beginning to think that perhaps there is not enough punishment to serve as a deterrence for those, whether it's individuals or whether it's an entire agency or whether it's an entire unit within an agency, that I'm beginning to think that there's not enough punishment to serve as a deterrence. Yes, I know that the, the Auditor General has the powers to disallow and then say charge. Um, and I'm sure that, that um, you know, efforts have been made to every so often recover some of these uh, monies for which concerns were raised about or were, were red flagged. But I get the feeling that year after year, for the most part, a lot of these infractions um, go, go unanswered. And so can you imagine a situation where, let's say, a particular agency is flagged for a number of violations and then in the next fiscal year uh, or in the next budget year, aside from you know wages and salaries, when it comes to their other operating expenses, you duck them or you make them pay some penalty for that. Right. Um, um, measures like that, for me, would force the hands of agencies to be a lot more vigilant and for individuals who are charged with ensuring that before they approve a given expenditure that all the documentation is in place um, is, you know, is right in place. If you if you strengthen the punishment regime, hopefully you may be able to get a strong deterrence where you might see some of these infractions uh, reduce. Uh, that, that is one thought that I have. I mean, we've talked about, um, you know, we keep talking, you know, in general conversations about the use of technology, right? Um, and so there's the, I think it's a gift mix or gift mix system. Yes, indeed. Right? And well, from what I saw time, in this report, not to interrupt you, a number of these payments did not go through the gift mix system. Exactly. That's so you say to yourself, is. we put in the technology, but some way, somehow, we find ways to bypass the technology. So if the technology is not the, is not the solution to these infractions, then the only thing that I can think of is punishment and severe punishment that serves as a deterrence. And what kind of punishment is there? I mean, the Auditor General is failing to surcharge. I don't know right. if you know the reason why he's failing to do so, but I mean, and, we, we seem to find solace in just asking people to refund monies they've stolen. I mean, how, how does that work? And I was even surprised that in this COVID-19 expenditure report, uh, in this COVID-19 audit, audit, uh, audit report, that on one of the infractions, the Auditor General simply says, um, go back and get the approval that you didn't get, you know, to, you know, to come up with variations in terms of how a given contract was supposed to uh, have, uh, have cost, you know, the state. And says that if you don't do that, then um, I would, you know, I would have to disallow, you know, the expenditure. Or there's a, another infraction where um, the ministry paid almost about 11 million uh, based on ANA certificates, right, in cash. And the auditor says, well, in the future, you know, try and eliminate that or reduce that. Uh, those don't seem for me strong warnings enough to serve as to serve as a deterrent. And so, like I said, if agencies suffer fiscal penalties for some of these infractions, 
if individuals beyond just like you said recovering the monies from them but if we really can prove that there was um, a willful intention to cause financial loss to the state that there is some other punishment like a you know like a prison sentence i which we have to make it very clear that these infractions are serious and they are serious enough that they will warrant very serious punishment otherwise year in year out and like i keep saying if you go back through history and look at these auditor general's reports the infractions are the same what has really changed is the magnitude of the infractions and indeed that's where the concern is dr patrick kumar boaji is director general of the ghana health service so the many people who have seen aspects of this report are raising questions about the accountability of the COVID-19 funds that we received and some of the taxes that we're even paying for. Government has levied us for mm -hmm. COVID levy. We're still paying COVID levy. We're still paying sanitation and pollution levy on every liter of petrol that we buy. So for you, for instance, Ghana Health Service, would you come out clean when all of this ends? Yes, I believe so. We did uh, acquit ourselves in the way that we not only showed about what this report talks about, it also talks about the, the outcomes that we are getting. So uh, I believe they drew it out there. But uh, I think these are all this report that uh, I'll go through a certain process to read on it. It's only what happened. So uh, I don't think it's a very good place to draw judgment on immediately. So what should be, and, and finally to you, um, Dr. Kwapong, we're going to have this table before Parliament. The Public Accounts Committee will sit, as we've seen over the period. They will make recommendations. Recommendations are not implemented. What can be done to ensure that the people who have to implement these recommendations by public consent committee actually do so? For instance, the, audit, the, the attorney general and then also the auditor general himself to surcharge. What has to be done? Good question, Alfred. So, again, um, you know, you can't necessarily force the auditor general's hand to disallow and surcharge. Um, you you can you know you can go back to uh, I've seen you know in the past there were a couple of lawsuits against the office of the auditor general you know getting the courts to impress upon the office that you really have to do this, but at the end of the day, even when there is that constitutional clarity giving that yes the auditor has the powers to do it, um, the person in that office has to actually exercise those powers. And if they can't, if they don't, it's either they are stepping aside or you just you just live with it. Which is why I keep wondering when the cycle would break outside of the severe punishments that I'm talking about, right? But then again, at the same time, someone has to levy those punishments against the offending individuals and the offending agencies. And until you have those who are charged with the powers to do that, to really flex their muscles and do that. I don't know what else the way is for it. I mean, but imagine an agency coming back before parliament um, during, you know, during the budget and the appropriations part, and parliament is able to say, we will not appropriate X amount of money as a penalty for this particular infraction. Maybe agencies will begin to wake up, but these are some of the thoughts that are just going through my head because, again, otherwise, Alfred, I'm sure next year we'll have another program where we will discuss another audit report with the same infractions um, and keep asking, well, what can we do about this? That's the reality of the unfortunate cycle of lack of punishment. That is fueling these continuous cases of corruption and diversion of public funds. But I appreciate your time uh, this evening, uh, Dr. John Osai Kwapong. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Dr. John Osai Kwapong is a senior fellow at the Center for Democratic Development, CDD, in Democracy and Governance. But
The Honorable Patrick Yabuama is the Member of Parliament for the Okaikwe Central Constituency. He is the Vice Chair of the Finance Committee of Parliament, he's also the Member of the Standing Orders Committee and Appointments Committee as well. My colleague Kamla Kluche sat with him earlier today about this matter and then also issues relating to the bonds because there's a development about the bonds especially the institutionalized investment schemes which the association of banks have also issued a statement on just coming through take a listen do you think that to some extent the the positions that the minority takes are justified auditor general's reports are not final reports if they were final report, they wouldn't be subjected to an inquiry by the Public Accounts Committee. There are preliminary findings of the Auditor General who brings it to Parliament. You realize that most of the time when they come to Parliament, most of the issues are resolved at the committee level because they're able to support some of the uh, um, claims with documentation, with documentation. Then it ends there. So the Auditor General makes some preliminary findings, but knowing how politicians are, some, how some politicians are, and how some political commentators are, they run to the public, and it becomes topical. For example, I was reading this morning about some $81 million for some COVID vaccine. I know probably by the end of the week, the health minister or the finance minister will be able to explain some of these issues. And you realize that there were not issues, but once it's captured, well, you recall that the minister of finance was on the floor. We debated the COVID funds. About 18.3 billion cities were spent on COVID-related issues. I don't, I don't think government of Ghana is too ready to throw away $81 million. Especially when you are having funds coming in from uh, donor funds yeah, and uh, World Bank. And, yeah. World Bank yeah. and um, after the performance of that function, that report of the Auditor General is supposed to be tabled before Parliament and a referral made to the Public Accounts Committee, chaired yeah. by the opposition. Yeah. So any organization or institution that is captured in that report, they have the power to subpoena that person or institution to come and explain. That is why we want a strong parliament with a very strong oversight, regardless of where you sit. Because at the end of the day, if we save money, we save money to develop this country. We have entered into a new year. Ken Ferretta is still at post. Are you convinced that he would ever take a bow um, timelines were given who are we as a caucus to to not to believe in what the president has said he said the, the man should lead the IMF negotiations to its end was that not the, the, the decision have we concluded on that well, so full details we find also on a3news.com and TV3 Ghana on Facebook. And on that bit and the, the reasons that the president gave for Ken Ofoyata still being at post, the domestic debt exchange program has faced a lot of resistance. And this, there's a latest information from the Ghana Association of Banks. And rightly so, the questions and concerns that all these stakeholders have raised about the current form in which the domestic debt exchange program is in have been seen to be legitimate by all concerned. Well, the, there's a joint press statement from the Ministry of Finance and the Ghana Association of Banks on this exchange program. And I'm going to scroll that on the screen shortly. It says the government of Ghana and the Ghana Association of Banks have made, according to this statement, significant progress on the terms for the participation of banks, that's commercial banks, in the domestic debt exchange program. This agreement encompasses final improvements to the terms of this exchange program, namely one, 
an agreement to pay 5% coupon. What this means, 5% interest for 2023. As against the earlier announcement of 0% interest, which was kicked against. And a single coupon rate for each of the 12 new bonds, resulting in an effective coupon, that's our interest rate of 9%. So this is a variation of the earlier announcement of no interest, that's 0% for 2023. Now, the next one, they say clarity on the operation, the operational framework and terms of access to the Ghana Financial Stability Fund, the removal or amendment of all clauses in the exchange memorandum that empowers the Republic to, at its sole discretion, vary the terms of the exchange. So this is a, another aspect which got many concerned that now there's no consultation. The, the finance ministry is able to vary the terms of the engagement without necessarily consulting all persons involved. That's where they've been concerned. Now, let us go on to Zoom now. Professor John Gachi is the dean of the University of Cape Coast Business School. Professor Gachi, thank you for time on Ghana tonight. So this statement that and the details in there, does it in any way address the fundamental concerns that the likes of you raised about this exchange program and how it's going to impact on the commercial banks especially yeah yes uh reading the statement by the ghana uh, association of bankers is very clear that they are satisfied with uh what they have agreed on so far uh it's now left with internal governance structures to take place and that internal governance structures means that uh, the uh, what is going on uh, is a board level matter, and then uh, um, 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 the the board have to meet uh, and accept what have been agreed on, and then uh, this also go beyond the board. And perhaps a special, uh, a special general meeting will have to be called for members to uh, accept the terms of the new uh, debt exchange program. Um, I think the former ones uh, have some clauses uh, that give unilateral power to government to vary the terms of the of the bond uh, if they think that that is what they want to do. But all those things have been removed. 2023 is attracting a coupon rate of 5%. And all other um, uh, uh, bonds of about 12 of them are uh, taking effective coupon of about uh, uh, 9%. And this is what we've been talking about because uh, bonds are structured based on annuities. And the way the bonds have been structured is as if we do not uh concern ourselves with annuity anymore so now after 2023 mm -hmm. it's like all the bonds are going to take a, a coupon rate of nine percent i see and I'm, I'm seeing the second part of this statement they're talking about some clarity on the operational framework and the terms of accessing the ghana financial stability fund which according to the finance ministry is supposed to cushion the commercial banks against the impact of this domestic exchange program does this answer the concerns the question about this the funds in there not being enough to even do make any difference for the banks if this action program goes through well as it is we don't know what clarity they have sought and they got uh i believe the clarity uh, will be around uh whether or not this stability fund will be taken at interest and so the bankers association and the banks will have to come clear what they have understood uh, from that clarity they are talking about because uh, the debt exchange program is just a call by government for the debt holders or the bondholders to support government so it is on uh, it is not um, something that is like uh, the banks themselves are managing and they have difficulties they go to uh, the central banks for liquidity support at interest. So 
uh, it should be very clear to us, just as they disclose what is happening in 2023, 5%. That's why they disclose that uh, those unilateral powers that government has arrogated to itself have been removed. They should also be very clear whether or not uh, when the banks have difficulties as a result of the implementation of uh, the exchange program, they are going to take that money at an interest. Mm -hmm. I see. And in my opinion, if they are going to take it at an interest, uh, that uh, defeats the purpose of you being a bondholder. Mm -hmm. I see. But um, th this finally, from what you, I get you saying, rests with the bondholders and the banks to take the final decision. I mean, with the details of this statement. Exactly so. So if they go to uh, um, the top management of the bank, that is the board of directors, and the directors accepted it, they pass it on to uh, the shareholders, the shareholders also accept it. Uh, we outside the banks cannot uh, claim to have any pain when those who are directly involved are satisfied. Uh, look, Professor Gachi, appreciate your time. Thank you. Professor John Gachi is a Dean of the University of Cape Coast Business School. A number of you have been sending us messages on Facebook and Twitter. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see a few of them, shall we, uh, while we round up. Um, many of you um, commenting on this uh, Auditor General's report. This one here from Richard Dahiagba says, it's possible today to discuss COVID-19 expenditure because Ghana made it through in one piece. Thank God and the people centered leadership says of the Kofuado government. So let's count the cost, but let's not forget how we pull through. Anyway, this one here from Manasseh Azuria when he says, if I'm surprised by anything, then it is the fact that the Auditor General's report is milder than what happened. In other words, the rot is worse than what the Auditor General has reported or published. That's Manasseh there. Suleiman Abrahima says, while they were embezzling the huge COVID funds, the poor masses were made to pay COVID-19 tax. I've never read this level of monumental corruption by a government. COVID-19 presented an opportunity for the elite in government and a crisis for the poor masses. And they still unashamedly, you see, uh, blame COVID-19 for the economic mess that, we, that they have created so it goes on and on and and we appreciate the many 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 of you commenting on this and the conversation continues as a matter of fact uh, join us on our various platforms as we continue this conversation thank you so much for staying with us here on ghana tonight on behalf of the team appreciate it i'm alfred good night